in all generations and at all times. And we know that you are still the same God. You said you are God, you change not. And on the basis of your faithfulness to Israel, that's why the sons of Jacob were not consumed. We read about our own Savior, Christ the Lord, that is the same yesterday, today and forever. He changes not. I will depend upon you that whatever happens in life, whatever the secret plans of the enemy, you will be faithful to your promises. And Lord, we know that your grace, your strength, your power will be sufficient for us. As we come to this session of learning, listening to you, we are praying that your word will enrich our lives in Jesus' name. Speak to us intimately. Keep us safe and secured. Keep us in the experience you have given us already. That our victory, triumph, will be constant and permanent. In Jesus' name, I pray. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. The thing that has killed or destroyed many ministers, workers, or many people who have followed the Lord in the past generations is that they were ignorant of the devices, the plans, the activities of Satan. You cannot fight effectively if you do not know the presence, the power, and the activities or the plans of your enemy. If you didn't even know that the enemy existed, and if you didn't know he had any deliberate plan against you, you'll never prepare for the battle. And in the past generations, it's very, very doubtful if many of those great men we have read about ever saw Satan act, even though he was very, very active. But coming on to the New Testament, you might have discovered that in the Old Testament, you do not have the frequent mentioning of Satan or the devil. Of course, the references come up in the Old Testament. But most of the time, the things that were done were done by the devil without the people seeing that the devil was doing much. But coming on to the New Testament, from the first few chapters of Matthew, you have the mention of the devil, of Satan. And then in the Gospels, you have frequent mention of devils, or demons, or evil spirits. When you come into the Acts of the Apostles, there is no doubt that the church knew that Satan was very active. Coming on to the epistles, there is no hiding of the fact that Satan or the devil or the adversary that he operated very much and the church was very conscious about his operations. And here Paul the Apostle told the Corinthian Christians and he said, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant 
office devices. From here you can learn that whenever we're ignorant of the devices or the plans or the activities of Satan, he takes or gets an advantage of you. Let's look at some instances in the Old Testament where there was ignorance concerning the activities of the devil. Remember that we're talking on the minister's spiritual warfare. Ministers, spiritual warfare. Ministers and members in the church have often shown ignorance concerning Satan's warfare and his mode of oppression. In Job chapter 1, Job chapter 1, from verse 13, and there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them. And the Serbians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the, the servants with the edge of the sword, I only am escaped to tell thee. In reference to this event, because the church knows the background, you have read from the first verses of chapter 1, and you have seen the discussion. But remember that that discussion did not take place on earth here. It was up in heaven. Job knew nothing about it. He slept. He woke. He went to his farm. He looked at his shepherds, looked at his cattle, looked at his family, and everything to him was going fine. Little did he know there was any discussion going on. If he knew that there was Satan at all, he might never think that Satan knew his house or knew his children or knew the amount of his possession. He was ignorant of Satan's devices. If all his shepherds that were working with him, if they knew that name Satan, they just knew that, well, there was Satan somewhere that may be operating somewhere but obviously not here. They were ignorant of the plans of the devil. They were ignorant of the devices of the enemy. And obviously with the report the messenger was making, that the oxen were plowing, the asses were feeding. And then the Serbians came, fell on them, and they took everybody, and then just slew all those servants with the edge of the sword. The servant reporting saw the Serbians, but didn't see Satan behind the activity. Many times we see the people, we do not see the devil behind the activity. Many times we see the disappointments, we do not see the devil behind the activity. Many times we see the failure, and we see the weakness, but we do not see the devil behind the activity. And in verse 16, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is falling from heaven. That's all they saw. They never saw Satan behind the action. But they thought it was God. And so this fellow made a report and said, the fire of God is falling from heaven and has burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I only am escaped alone to tell thee. When something evil has happened and a fellow has been spared to come and give you the information that something bad happened to you and you are going on rejoicing not knowing that something is happening behind the door, you do not see Satan behind the reporter. You just see 
a person that is giving information. But did Job see Satan at all in all these things? Killing everybody and sparing only the person to bring bad news? Did Job see that that was Satan's strategy? And in verse 17, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, they have slain the servants of the edge of the sword. I only, I am escaped alone to tell thee. Those who analyze events taking part or taking place in our lives, they generally will not bring Satan into the show. Now, if the same thing is happening in different ways, and the report is coming the same way, don't you see there is a personality that is working in a systematic way behind the scene? The Serbians fell on these, took them away, killed the servants. Fire fell from above and killed, burnt all the sheep and the servants. Only one person escaped to tell it. Verse 15, only one person escaped to tell it. Verse 17, only one person escaped to tell the bad news. While he was still speaking in verse 18, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, smote the four corners of the house, and it fell on the, upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only. This report that is always coming from I only. Do we see any adversary behind him? Behind the individual that is coming always to bring the bad news. And everybody will die except one person to relate how it happened. When every, if everybody died and nobody was able to give any report you don't know how it has happened but when there's somebody to give all the details how the fire fell then that was such an imag imagination ruling that they must have felt like this and been like this and been like that and it says i only am escaped to tell thee and job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't see Satan behind the scene. And Paul the Apostle said, We are not ignorant of Satan's devices. They saw the fire. Not the Satan, not the devil. They saw the wind. They saw the thieves. Without seeing Satan in the warfare. Often when a friend comes to talk to us about the will of God in our lives, but he tells us, you'll never do it. But Jesus Christ had just told his disciples that I'll be taken. I'll die. The third day, I'll rise up. All the disciples were together, and Peter. I'm sure Peter did not see Satan behind his utterance. I'm sure Peter did not think that Satan was involved with this. This is normal, ordinary, legitimate sympathy with the Master. Lord, it will never happen to you. But probably no one but Christ would have seen Satan behind that, and said, get thee behind me, Satan. And so we need to understand that many things that happen that relate to the spiritual warfare in ministers' lives, we will not know that it's Satan. You know, Joab had been commanded by David. And David had said, go and count the soldiers in the army of Israel. 
Well, Job did not see Satan behind that actually, but Job just felt it was unnecessary that God could deliver by many or by few. So why should the king, my lord, do anything like this? May the armies of Israel be in their thousands, be multiplied. And David said, go and do what I told you to do. I want it as urgently as possible. And you know the comment of the Bible that Satan provoked him, pushed him, made him to be uh, restless until that thing was done. But the Bible says it was Satan that caused it. But David did not see Satan behind that. Neither did Joab. They were sitting and eating, the twelve and the master. And everybody was looking at the master. He had been telling them some things that jolted them, that made them feel, feel, feel uneasy. And then he started by saying, one of you will betray me. And he said, is it I? Is it I? Is it no. The one that I'll put the food in the soap and put in his mouth, that's he. They didn't see Satan around. They just saw disciples. And he put the food in uh, Judas Iscariot's mouth. And he said, what you do, do quickly. Then he rose up. Nobody saw Satan. But it's when the Holy Spirit caused John to write that he said, after he received that thing, Satan entered into him. But nobody saw Satan entering. But the Bible said Satan entered. Many people are ignorant of the devices of the devil. Ananias and Sapphira, they were having a normal family meeting. Close door meeting between husband and wife. Who will think that when husband and wives meet together to discuss, to think about how they are going to plan their commitment, their consecration, and their service. And they are just telling one another, now this year, this is how we are going to serve the Lord. We must be moderate about it. We must not go too far about it. We must remember that we have a family to cater for all these children. Somebody must care for them. Who will think that Satan is in the meeting? And so they agreed together and said, we'll sell it. Yes, we should still give something to the Lord and something to the work of the Lord. What do you think? Well, half will be all right. A part will be all right. You think that's all right? Will the rest be enough to take care of ourselves and the family? Well, I think that should be okay. Do we tell the apostles that we have kept back part of the amount? No, if we did that, they will think we are not consecrated enough. That's just normal discussion. Who will know that Satan was there to fill their heart? And here Ananias came before Peter. And then Peter looked at him and said, Is it so much? He said, Yes. And then Peter said, Why has Satan filled your heart? But do we see Satan filling somebody's heart in normal family discussion? He does, but we don't see him. The warfare is there, but we don't see him. The battle is there, but we don't see him. That's why the apostles said, we must not be ignorant of Satan's devices. Because if we do, he'll get an advantage over us. Fighting an unseen foe and not knowing that a fight is even going on while the fire is really burning and the fight is really tense. And the enemy, the foe, is well armed and determined to conquer. And um, you are not even prepared for the fight. You don't know that he's even fighting. And he has all his gadgets, instruments, armor on, and he's fighting. And you are just relaxing. Obviously such a person will be defeated. And that's why in the battle of life, that's why in spiritual warfare, Many people are defeated without knowing that there is any defeat going on. The fight 
is on every moment of the day. But the question is, how will the ignorant ever win in the battle? They'll never win. And here is where we need to be very, very careful. The tendency all over the world now is that our messages must be positive. And we have preachers already now that feel inconvenient to read passages that they say are negative. And sure enough, there are some utterances in the Bible that are brought out in a negative style deliberately, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. But everything is good. But some of the statements and messages are put forth in a negative way. Look at this. He that denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. That looks negative, but that's true. Because denial a negative thing. Confessing is a positive thing. And then it says, he that sins is a servant of sin. That looks negative. And it says that wicked man, a little leaven that will leaven the whole lump, get him out of the congregation, hand him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his soul may be saved. That's a little bit negative. Them that sin, rebuke them sharply before all, that they may fear. That looks negative. Now, Pastor at Ephesus, I know your work. And I know your labor. And I know that those who say they are apostles, but are not, you have tried them, and you have known their liars. All the same, yes, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Now, repent quickly, otherwise I will come and take the candlestick out of its place. That looks negative. Pastor in studies, you have a name that you lay, but you are dead. Strengthen the things that remain, lest I come against you and fight you with a sword in my mouth. That looks negative, but that is true. Pastor in Tatira, I have this against you. You have that woman that calls herself Jezebel. And is seducing my servant. I will cast her upon a bed of affliction. And all the church will know that I'm the one that tries the reins and the hearts of men. That looks negative. David, look at what you have done. As a result of this, you have made the enemies of God to blaspheme against the God of Israel. Because of this, there will be sword in your house. Nathan, what do you say? Not only that, that child will even die. That's negative, but that's the truth. And many times, because of our endeavor to be positive, always looking for promises in the Bible, always looking for God will do this, God will do this, God will do this. The other ones that God has said, that if he has sons are not pastors, that whom he loveth, he corrected. And there is no correction or chastisement that is a pleasure or enjoyable for now. But he does this so that you may be a partaker of his holiness. We don't read all that about chastisement. We have even got to the point we don't want to read about persecution and about temptation. Or because all those things are negative. We are going to be positive. There is no way you can be positive without getting the whole word of God. You see this light we have? The electricians will tell you we have the negative and the positive. You see the days in which we live? We have the night and we have the day. You see the seasons that we have? We have the dry season, we have the rainy season. We need rain, but it will be unfortunate if it rains every day of the whole year. We need the sun, we need the dry season, but it will be bad if it's dry season all throughout the year. And uh, we need the light of the day to keep us through, but 
It will be a strange day if all through the day and the night the sun just keeps shining. And everywhere is hot every time. And you want to sleep, you cannot sleep because there is no night anymore. God has decided everything will be positive only day. But you must understand that life is a mixture. And the mixture deepens your understanding. The mixture helps your experience in life to be a real man. You are not a boy that is uh, ignorant of everything that is going on around you. And all that you are looking for is just the positive and the positive. Now because of the positive that people are emphasizing, that's not in our church alone. In fact, in our church we didn't have this difficulty. You must understand that when we started Deeper Life Bible Church or Deeper Christian Life Ministry, all these things that we wrote on, that were written on your program, the life in the camp or camping lifestyle, as we put it for this Congress, we'll go through one by one. And when we come to Romans chapter 16, verse 17, that if anybody causes offenses, contrary to the things we have learned, mark him and avoid him. Our ushers were vigilant. If Jehovah's Witnesses brought tracts to distribute, they seized them. In the early days of the church, if uh, people that have their prophets in America or in Britain, they brought the scrolls of their prophets to distribute in our retreat, our ushers will be vigilant and seize them. If all the teachings and books of the present day so-called prophets in America, if they are being sold in our retreat, we pack them up. We tell them we're sorry here. We mark those who cause offenses. Contrary to the things that we have learned, we avoid them. But over the years, the influence of the charismatics that are coming up almost in every church, in the Catholic Church, in the Baptist Church, in the Anglican Church, and in a lot of churches, Orthodox churches, these charismatics are bringing in the faith attitude. And in a way we rejoice that where there was no light at all before, there is a spark of light. The people that sat in darkness and under the shadow of death, they saw a little light now. And they are coming to the light of the Savior, but not the full light, just a little light through the charismatics. And because of that, because we rejoice with them a little bit, because where it was total darkness, absolute darkness before, little light is coming up, we have relaxed. Now, with our workers, you find a lot of books. All these pamphlets that talk about faith without endurance, talk about prosperity without self-denial, talk about the blessing of Abraham without the sacrifice of Abraham on Mount Moriah, talk about Paul, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me without talking about I've learned how to be obeyed and how to abound. We have got from all these books a part of the message of faith, no self-denial. The prosperity, no sacrifice. The victory, but no warfare. We are more than conquerors, but we are not resisting temptation. And because of that, this church, deeper life, has been affected too. As our preachers can tell us the whole truth, when last did you hear in your own stage about overcoming temptation? Are there temptations again? Are we not now in another dispensation? We have the old covenant. We have the new covenant. All those in the new covenant in the New Testament, they faced persecution. They faced temptation. And they resisted temptation. But now there is another covenant that's we don't know about in heaven. But 
the charismatics know about that covenant. In that covenant, there's so much provision, there's no temptation, there's no persecution, there is no self-denial, there is no commitment. All we know now in that covenant, very strange covenant, is that it's a covenant without any condition. The Bible says, receive the devil so he can flee from you. They never tell us that again. No temptation has ever come to man that is higher or greater than he can bear, that is not common to every other person. But God, with the temptation, will make a way so that you'll be able to escape. we we'll never hear anything about that anymore. As I preach to other people, I put my body under. Buffet my own body. Keep my body under. Lest, after preaching to others, I become a castaway. If you are old in this church, when you are coming for retreat, national retreat, you will hear all those verses of the Bible. But now that we are positive, so that we can follow our colleagues who are preaching in other churches, so we too can say, well, we too are faith preachers. There is nothing like that in the Bible. There are no faith preachers in the Bible. They are preachers of the full, entire, unadulterated gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they preach everything. Not just faith. Do you hear that? That person says, God has raised him up. You know what God has raised him up to do? To preach only healing. And we excuse them. Oh, we say that's their ministry. That's rubbish. Then we say, that person, oh, is a mighty faith preacher. That's the ministry God gave him. When did God see you? That he gave somebody faith ministry. He didn't give him repentance ministry. They are not to preach repentance. They are not to preach persecution. That's not their ministry. They are not to preach holiness. You know, that's not their ministry. Their ministry is to preach faith. And we read that in all these books. God raised them up. Go and teach my people faith. Yes, sir. The people that you are teaching faith, they are still smoking and drinking. We can't touch that. They are divorced and remarried. We can't touch that. And Satan is fighting them in their families. They are not living victorious lives. We can't touch that. The faith they are teaching us, brothers and sisters, the faith to buy a new car. It, can God really think about it? Send a man. Go and teach my people faith to have vehicles. Go and teach my people faith to get healed. Healing all the time. Go and teach my people faith. Whatever you say, you will have. And yet they are living defeated lives. The God of the Bible. The God who has given us the entire gospel. The God who knew that a son died on the cross of Calvary, that the people will be saved and be free from sin. He has not said, he knows that we don't have enough preachers. Christ himself said, the laborers are few, the harvest is small. And God, the God of heaven, did not send out people to preach repentance, to preach holiness, to tell the people, come back to me. All that is sending the people to go and preach now is, go and tell my people that, Whatever they say, it will be theirs. Don't let us make God cheap. Whatever you want to preach, preach. But don't say God. Because we know the God of the Bible. It's of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. And there is this spiritual warfare going on. And I don't have time. I would have told you, I can go from one preacher to the other. Of those who have died now. But they died terrible death. A. A. Allen was one of the real key figures in the charismatic and the healing renewal that started in the late 40s. And he went about with real crusades. In those days, when they used to publish their write ups of their crusades and of their tents, they used to brag. Our robots will say, I have the largest tent in the whole of America. 
And then uh, this man, A. Allen, will try to see the dimension of that change and make his own a little bit bigger. And then in the next report of his magazine, he'll say, now I have the largest change. And then he'll mention the dimensions of the other change. And he'll say, but these are my dimensions. That's what they were bragging with. But you know, even though he cast out devils, healed the sick and all that, he was addicted to drinking. Heavy, heavy drinking. And when he died, and he carried out the autopsy, he carried out to find out how did he die, what actually killed him. His whole body system was saturated with alcohol. And I know that there are people that have his uh, books and his outlines and a lot of things they're written on how to cast out demons, how to heal the sick and all that. And quite a lot of people. That if you get the book, all things are possible. You can write that down. That's a book. All things are possible. That book tells you about everything that all those people did. And those who have died now, and those who are still alive, the, all the history is there. But today, many people will not face the real issue. And to know that deeper life is not a church that just concentrates on just one thing, on prosperity, on healing, on faith, on how to get married. Deeper Life Bible Church is raised up to teach the entire gospel, everything. Not withholding the truth because that person will not like it. They will become deceivers. Right now, some preachers cannot tell Catholics that there's no way of salvation going in that way. And some of our preachers now, there is extra carefulness. With all these association, associations coming on, the Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria is there, and you know, all, these other go all these gospel churches are there, and uh, they say that deeper life is there. Uh, you need to be very, very intelligent when, you, when they tell you things like that. Actually, for the PFN, it was a minister in Lagos that put deeper life there and said they are not uh, Catholic, they are not um, Orthodox, they are not Evangelical, they believe Holy Ghost baptism, they are Pentecostal. If they ask me who put their name, I'm the one who put their name. Because they wanted us there by all means. I wrote a letter to them, I said, uh, I've seen your letter, we'll pray over it. We normally go slowly in taking decisions, so we'll see what to do. He saw me in a particular meeting and said, uh, Brakui, I said, yes, he said, I put you in PFN. I know that you said you are still writing us, but I put you there. You are PFN. But I wouldn't fight with him. I wouldn't say anything because of that. I smiled. I said, thank you, sir. But we still have that doctrinal distinction. And you don't get me attending every meeting going on in town. I don't attend meetings where they are, all, they are always discussing how to contribute money, how to do this, how to have an association. They never talk about repentance. I never attend such meetings. It's a waste of time. And you ministers who are wasting your life, life is too precious. Life is too short. Only 24 hours a day. And you see how the hours fly? You go to spend three hours, four hours in a meeting. And all you are discussing is... Uh, You'll discuss uh, northern politics, you'll discuss Kaduna politics, you'll discuss Lagos politics, you'll discuss Muslims and Christians. Is that gospel? That this is what has brought us together now because of all this trouble, all this trouble, that is why we are coming together and spending four hours, hours we should have sp spent like Daniel on our faces before the Lord. Without those associations, if we pray more, there will be confusion in the enemy camp. But no prayer, just meeting, just meeting, just meeting. They tell us that in America they have such association. In uh, Europe they have such association. And Jesus prayed for the unity of the church. He prayed for us to be having meetings for four hours, arguing with ourselves. We can't get head or tail. And deeper life people who are attending such meetings, wasting your time, wasting your life, God can put you on the shelf for meetings. Then he will select his own ministers who are for preaching. 
But many people don't recognize the devices of the enemy that life is going, life is being wasted. Our lives are not as spiritual as they were years ago. All these doctrines have infiltrated into the church. And now there is no uniformity. In some places, all you hear about is all these things I spoke about, the money and the marriage and having children and having cars. In some churches now, all that you know that God is blessing me. And when you hear about all this blessing, no salvation blessing, no sanctification blessing, no Holy Ghost baptism blessing, except the new Holy Ghost baptism now. Because there's a new Holy Ghost baptism. Peter never taught anybody how to speak in tongues. Neither did Paul. It will be strange for you to read in the Bible. That when Paul, when Peter was in the house of Cornelius, that he gathered them together. And he was instructing Cornelius how to speak in tongues. Don't speak English. And then Peter will be speaking publicly in tongues. And Cornelius will deceive himself and repeat what Peter said. And he said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, we have got it, we have got it. We got it. After we have got all these things that they say we have got, look at what is happening. When we started deeper life in 1973, August, I wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost. It was on the 23rd of October, 84, more than a year after we started deeper life, that I became baptized. But the point is this. People did not know that I was not baptized in the Holy Spirit, but when I came back, I traveled out for a particular course in Chelsea College at the University of London in London. And um, I had time with myself. I had time to pray. I had time to do whatever I wanted to do. And somebody helped me to show me that this is the promise of God. If ye be so evil, not to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God, your Father, give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? I will have to read that verse for about four times, asking me, will God do it now? Eventually, he will pray. He didn't uh, pray for me. He didn't uh, speak in tongues and tell me, now don't speak English, repeat after me. Yeah, I was too intelligent to accept anything like that. Apart from even being a Christian, I have enough intelligence to know that I wanted something real. And that I wanted the Holy Ghost, not because I would come and start deeper life, deeper life had been started. I wanted the Holy Ghost, not so that I would have opportunity and preach at Monday Bible study. I was already having Monday Bible study. I wanted the Holy Ghost, not so that SU will invite me to come and preach. They were all, they were inviting me. They didn't know I was not baptized in the Holy Ghost. That wasn't even a major problem with them. They invited everybody. They even sometimes invite people that are not born again. So I about me that I was even born again and sanctified. So I wanted the Holy Ghost for myself to have a real effective ministry. And I got the Holy Ghost. When I came back, you, you have never heard me. I've never spoken in tongues publicly in the congregation. Never. I'm a disciplined preacher. I discipline myself. Never allow my emotion or the unction to run off and live the real settled life of the minister and then act like others act. I know what they do. I listen to them. I hear them. But you'll never find me do that as your preacher. But the people recognize because it was easier for me to minister. And the people, many people were getting saved. And things were expanding. And the work was actually being blessed. Now, I knew it was because I just received the Holy Ghost baptism. But they didn't see any difference. I didn't become emotional. I didn't uh, shake while praying. The format and all the things I did before was what I was still doing. But the power, the anointing, the unction had come in. That was just the addition. But all these ones that were going to the back of the yard, and we're saying, brother, 
before we go from this Congress, come and give me the Holy Ghost. And he's saying, yes, after the meal, I will come. Don't worry, don't worry. Everybody that I pray with, they always get it. That's a lie. They get something, but not what they are looking for. And then we take them to the back, and then we say, now, I will pray for you. I've been praying for many, many people. They always get it. God has given this gift to so-and-so, given this gift to so-and-so. People have different gifts. And this fellow that is still living in sin, back in the local government, you say, now, just raise up your hand. Say, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And then the man becomes unconscious, doesn't know what he's saying again. And then he misses what he says. That's it, you have got it. Praise the Lord. The man went to the hostel to his friends and said, this Congress did something for me. I got the Holy Ghost. Wait till we go back. We know those who have the Holy Ghost. Those who have the Holy Ghost, Satan fears them. Those who have the Holy Ghost, when they pray, they have immediate answers. Those who have the Holy Ghost, they have comforter resident in them. For the people that have Holy Ghost and they cry, 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 there is no comforter. That's Holy Ghost. The people that have the Holy Ghost, they read Bible, they don't understand. They have the spirit of truth and they don't know truth. That's Holy Ghost. The people that have Holy Ghost and the preacher is preaching outside, they deceive them and they go into false doctrine. That's Holy Ghost. The people that have Holy Ghost and the charismatics and the Catholic Church, they're still worshipping Mary. That's Holy Ghost. The people that have Holy Ghost in all these other places, they are saying that Jesus Christ is not only the Savior now, there is so and so who also can save. That's Holy Ghost. And they are going into error. And they cannot live right. People that have Holy Ghost and they have evil thoughts. When they read in the Bible, they say, this evil thought is still my problem since I got the Holy Ghost. No, since you got a spirit. You've got a spirit. You need deliverance. But many people don't realize. And they have changed deeper life to another thing. To a sex. They think that when we're coming, all we're looking for now is something emotional. But who ever taught you that? We didn't see Satan behind all this, but Satan is there. He has polluted all the other places. One by one, one by one. Great churches of the past. The Methodist Church. Look at what they have become. Can you see Satan behind that? Can you see some of these gospel churches that I don't want to mention one by one? Can you see Satan walking behind the scene? And now he has come to deeper life. But we don't see him. All we see is our revival. All we see is our dressing is still there. All we see is that we're building houses. We're now having more money. We now have problem with car park. There are so many cars. Even the Lord blessing us, that's what we see. We don't see Satan behind the scene. Destroying and polluting. And that's a serious warfare. But at the beginning of this year, we are going to pull every stronghold down. And you must bring back the whole message. The children of Israel, they told one another, let's bring back the king. And to bring back Christ, the king, in the midst of this church, we'll have to bring back the whole teaching of the word of God. If we honor him and honor his word, Christ will reign, and he will reign supreme. When he does, he himself will build his church. And then the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. But what's Satan's purpose? I've shown you in the Bible that he works without being recognized. But how is it? What does he do? And what's the reason for his doing what he does? One is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. 
The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. That means when the thief comes, it's to steal something away. Now, if a thief had ever stolen before, do they steal scraps of paper? Do they steal the peels of oranges that you put in the garbage can and they throw that away? That's not a thief. That's a scavenger. Carrying dirty things about. When thieves come, they steal things that are precious. Well, you may not understand this because of the thieves today. The thieves today will make announcements sometimes before they come. Satan doesn't do that. It's wiser than that. The thieves of today, when they enter in, they wake everybody up. They say, get up, get up. Where is your money? That's because they don't know where the money is. Satan doesn't do that. The thieves of today, they harass everybody. And you know, thief, thief, you begin to cry, thief, 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 thief. Then they steal violently away. But Satan, quietly, without announcement, without even making you to know that he is the one doing anything, he steals everything away. But you know the pity is that if you have been having certificate in a particular drawer and you didn't think about that certificate it's very important to you but you are not using it at present you are having a good work that you have secured and a thief came no announcement no violence and then stole the certificate away you will not know you don't need it now when you know it is when you are terminated from where you are working and you say, well, I'll get another job, I'm qualified, then you go to where the certificate was. You can't find it. A thief has stolen it away at a time you are not aware. Many of the things that Satan steals away, people don't recognize because he doesn't make announcements. And his purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy. Think about all the qualities you have got since you became a Christian. And today, some of those qualities that are no more there, how did you lose them? Satan, without announcement, stole them away. And now it's taking us time to get it back. When you were a young Christian, quietness was your pattern of life. If you spoke at all, that means that that thing was important. A very great quality. And you are deep. You are sensitive to the word of God. Like deep rivers that are very quiet. That's how you are. But you cannot tell when you became the person you are now. Your quietness is stolen away. Meditation is stolen away. Every good quality is stolen away. And now you are crying, God, why am I like this? The thief had come unannounced and had taken away something precious from you. How I believe and pray and desire that all that Satan has stolen away, you will get it at this Congress. In First Peter, chapter 5, Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a running lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. He comes to devour, to destroy, and he says, Resist him. I told you, number one, his purpose is to steal. Number two, his purpose is to devour, destroy. Three, Revelation chapter 12, 
verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. His purpose is also to deceive. And then, his purpose is to cause you to deny God. In Job, Job, chapter 1, from verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God or not? Verse 11. Put forth thine hand now, touch all that he has, and he will cause thee to thy face. He will. He'll deny you. That was his purpose. He wanted Job to cause God, deny God. That's why he put forth his hand and touched all those things. Look at chapter 2 of Job, verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Cause God and die. Satan said, If you touch him, all that he has, he'll curse you to your face. That's actually his purpose. That's what he wanted. But he will not come before you, having two horns, having a black body, being haggard, terrible, mischievous in look. He will go to another person to fulfill and achieve that purpose. And so the wife said, my husband, are you still retaining your integrity? Look at what has been happening. Cause God and die. But even though Job did not know that it was Satan, behind that still said no you talk like a foolish woman what do you think worshipping God entails of do you think that I'm serving God for bread and butter only for goody goodies like babies that you can quieten them by giving them sweet or little little things Shall a man receive good at the hand of the Lord and not receive evil? His theology was wrong. His heart was right. And because of the right attitude, eventually God removed all those problems. But the major point I want you to see is that Satan wants you to deny God. Matthew chapter 16. From verse 21. From that time forth, began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Then he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus knew that that was Satan, wanting to make him to forsake God's eternal plan. Before the foundation of the world, it had been determined that Christ will die for the sins of humanity. And now here came Peter, he thought he was giving advice. He was sympathizing. But he wanted Jesus to forsake God's eternal plan. What does he want you to do? In this spiritual warfare, he wants you to forsake God's eternal plan. And he wants you to disobey and offend God. First Timothy chapter 2 and first, verse 14. First Timothy. 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 
Now it was Satan that caused birth. Benin. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Part of his purpose is to hinder or prevent the progress of the gospel. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. And that he may recover, they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. He wants to ensnare, he wants to enslave. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil. He wants to seduce you into falsehood. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his corrupted, through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. His purpose is to corrupt your mind from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now we've seen the purpose of Satan, wanting to steal, wanting to devour, wanting to deceive, wanting to make you deny God, and wanting to make you to be corrupted from the simplicity of the gospel. How does he do this? He does this one by temptation to entice, assault your mind, and draw you away from where you are standing. And he does that with many things does that with different things for different people. Sometimes we have thought that Satan only uses one or two things, but that's not true. Satan uses a lot of things. But the major thing, he uses money. And there are many people already that have gone away from the Lord because of money. Jesse Rice was a preacher of the gospel, although in the evangelical circles, not Pentecostal. Yet, he was one of the conservative preachers of his day. When he was young as a preacher, he was discussing with another preacher because when he came out of college, they will go out to evangelize. Sometimes both of them will sing together. And then they started getting into the ministry of preaching. This minister friend was discussing with J.C. Rice. And he said, I'll keep on preaching as long as God keeps on providing for me, meeting my needs, feeding my family, and giving me all that I want. The moment God stops, Providing for all my needs, I quit. Jesse Rice replied and said, I will not say that. The other fellow said, why wouldn't you say that? Oh, he said, because I know who I am. That if I have everything I want, that thing will get in my spirit, in my head, in my mind, everywhere, will ruin me completely. But that that God can even choose a person like me to preach. I'm so grateful that I will preach, even if I have to dig ditches during the day to make a living and preach at night. Even if my family, if they are wearing tattered dress, and people are accusing me that I don't take care of my wife and of my family, I've made up my mind 
for this privilege and opportunity God has given to me to preach, I will preach. Of course, you need to know. At the end, J.C. Rice preached a lot, wrote a lot of books, maintained a magazine, championed the cause of those who are conservative, and was vehemently against ecumenism going on at his own time, and he was, by and large, an effective preacher, even though he was evangelical. But the other fellow, well, he said he will quit. And when you say that, you'll quit. He said he will not preach until the end. And when you say that, you don't preach until the end. He said, if God starts giving me this and giving me that, then I will forsake God and forsake his preaching. And God doesn't want people like that in the front line of his army. He disposes of them. Money can be a great thing that the devil will use and lure many, many people away. And in the records that have come to my hand on many ministers, I have known some myself, Nigeria here. I've read of many in America. And sometimes a few of them that have spoken with me, they have spoken as if they were giving testimony. But they don't understand spiritual warfare. Somebody spoke to me in October. And he said, now that you see I'm a businessman, you may not really understand that that's what he said. He went to Bible school, spent three years or more, and actually was pastoring a church, but something happened that uh, people misunderstood him when he left the pastorate and said now what he was going to do was to be a real businessman, and God has prospered his business now. Now he can give money to those who are preaching, but as for him to preach, no, he has quit. And they called him in a meeting I attended to give a testimony. He gave a testimony like a businessman. But the glory departed. Another fellow, very deeply consecrated. But some of the principles of life that sharpened my dedication in the late 60s. I wrote them at the back of the old Bible that I used to carry about. And those principles that timeless. He didn't read them. He wasn't too educated. But you could read the English Bible. He will spend a lot of time and then he'll be praying. Generally, when he said he had quiet time, the least period of time would be about three hours. They just kneel down, just praying and praying. Many of the choruses who are singing today in deeper life that uh, you don't know their source, it was at his, on his knees in the prayer meeting or in the prayer, communion with God, that God gave him those choruses and he will pen them down. He didn't study music. But was a close friend. When he came out of that prayer closet, he will discuss with me and I will sit down at his feet. I will learn those choruses from him challenging things. Then he'll tell me something that God told him when he was praying, and it will be powerful principles. And then I will write them down at the back of my Bible. And then next week again, we'll meet, and then we'll sit down again. we almost of the same age. I might be a little bit older, but he had deep spirituality. And he'll tell me again, I got another chorus. And there are deep, deep choruses with real meaning, challenging meanings. And then he'll teach me those choruses. And then he had another principle again. He'll bring out the promise very deep. You, need to, you really need to be close to God because it's not something you'll read about in any magazine, any book. Then I'll write everything down. I wasn't hearing from God like I was hearing from God. And I will go and pray on those principles. And it shaped my early Christian life. And then he went into preaching. And it was not strange because there was nothing else he could do. I knew he was spiritual. That was a slide. When he stood before the congregation, many in those days, 
uh, we didn't have uh, effective chorus leaders. They will sing the way they wanted to sing. He'll come up there and lead a chorus first before preaching. He'll prepare them like that. When he begins to lead that chorus, the Spirit of God will pervade that atmosphere. And then, after that, the sinner, the meeting was solemn, and he'll preach the word. He wouldn't move about a lot. Very young man. But, of course, a long story short. Is now in business. The glory had departed. And I can show you one by one the people that have had this spiritual warfare, but they were ignorant of Satan's devices. And they slipped off by a seemingly little thing. Might be money. Because those days, when he had that impact in my life, I used to watch him because fasting was a way of life. I thought that when I was in the Ladura church before I was converted, I thought I was fasting. When I would fast once in a while. But this man, fasting was his lifestyle. And do you know, it was from him that I learned he never told his need to anybody. Never. He'll, whenever he had a need, He'll go to God and say, my father. When he said, my father, you felt it. He, he, he was that close to God. And when he comes back from that prayer closet and he discusses with you and said, I asked my father. Even though I was saved, I would say, the day I can call God my father like this. I knew I was saved. I was even sanctified. But the touch, the intimacy, I knew that it will take a long time for me to be able to come to that. And whatever he needed, he would just go like that and pray. And then in a few days, all those things, if it's money, if it's clothes, they will sow that thing according to his size. Somebody will pass on it and give it to him. That time we didn't hear many messages on the authority of the believer. But was that brother... If he was standing like this and something was going on, he didn't, have, he didn't want that thing, silently he would make a decree. It would be like he wanted. But now a businessman. It was, I think, last year, he sent 100 naira to Dipalai from the post and said, My brother, been long together. I hear all the things that is going on now. And then I watch you over the television and my heart rejoices that at least you have continued. I'm sending this amount of money. I know your life. We are friends. Anything you do, I can defend you anywhere I can stand for you. That other people are not doing well. Because he knows the doctrine, he knows everything, knows the methodology, know, we knew everything together. And he sent that hundred naira. But we have not seen face to face for some time. The devil can use money. The devil can use women. The devil can use ambition. What cannot the devil use? He can use the wind, he can use fire, he can use anything. He can use your own very mind against you. Satan's warfare against the ministers of God. In five years' time, in ten years' time, if Jesus tarries, what will be the story about you? Will you still be on the field, firing, preaching, ministering? Let's rise up and pray. Our Father and our God, we bless and thank you once again because you have really opened unto us your very mind and you have revealed unto us all those things that will ensure that by your grace we will be able to live lives of victory all the while. And so dear Lord God, we are asking Lord that in all the ways that the devil 
Satan may be trying or even has tried in time past and even succeeded in some way to have warfare against your own children in this church. Ministers and those that you have committed your work into their hands. Father, I'm praying, Lord God, that you really intervene and help us so that right from now on, we will not be ignorant of his devices in Jesus' name. Eternal Lord God, you have shown us in your word that he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He comes to devour. He comes to make people, those who are your children, to deny you. Eternal Lord, I'm praying that in any way in which he has done this, this in time past, in our lives, Lord, that there be a full stop to it today in Jesus' name. We have been told, out of your own prophetic way of dealing with us, that the devil himself is even having heroes, trying to have heroes into the church, so that we are not able all again to preach the whole cancer of the word of God in many places. Eternal Lord God, in any way in which you have succeeded in time past, I'm praying that this will be the final end of this success of the devil in Jesus' name. Eternal Lord God, by your grace, by your power, grant us the balanced teachings of the word of God, showing forth the whole counsel of your world, teaching the people so that they can be set free indeed, and pray that God, this will be our ministries in Jesus' name. We have been told, and we have seen it, in testimony that he uses various means. He uses money, he uses women, he uses ambition. Father, I'm asking you, Lord, that you will intervene in the lives of each and every one of us, that we will be so single-minded that the devil will not have any inroad into our lives in Jesus' name. We are praying, Lord God, for every one of us present in this meeting, that you help us even from now on to put on your very whole armor. Father, your righteousness, the preparation of the gospel of peace, your truth, your helmet of salvation, Father, your shield of faith, to have everything balanced in our lives, such that at all times, after we have defeated the devil, that we will still keep standing in Jesus' name. Um, I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the door. I just thank God for all his provision. I just blessed you with the 